I have only one pair of good boots, and I seldom get to use them. But they were the first thing I packed. For 15 days I traveled through Central Africa, into the middle of the continent, in the middle of some of the worst humanitarian disasters in the world. Our objective was to gauge the state of the church here, if there was one, and to learn how Africa Inland Mission might re-engage these lands with a renewed missionary effort. What do you take on a trip like that? Good boots and a Bible, a notebook and an open mind, and, if you dare, an open heart. Into Sudan, Congo, Chad, and the Central African Republic, four countries with a combined landmass equal to two-thirds of the United States, but without the roads. So where the Land Rovers wouldn't go, we traveled by air, motorcycle, dugout canoe, and of course by foot over thousands of miles of savanna, rainforest, mountain, and desert. The landscapes were forbidding and beautiful, sunlit villages of thatch and meandering footpaths, smiling children, women carrying the wares of life on their heads. But one has a sense on a journey such as this, that there's more to the story of the people and the land than you can catch at a glance. When you take time for a cup of tea and a conversation, you begin to see the real picture, and it is largely a disheartening one. From the southern mountains of Sudan all the way inland to Lake Chad, these four unique nations share one tragic history. Each gained independence from colonial rule somewhere around 1960, and each replaced one kind of oppression with another. What followed has been decades of human conflict and unfathomable suffering. Economies and communities were destroyed, Infrastructures crumbled, people scattered, the wicked prospered, and the righteous lost their homes. All four countries in recent years were listed among the 10 least stable places in the world, but those are only the political woes. For most of the people here, generations of spiritual darkness rooted in animistic beliefs have led to a culture steeped in fatalism and fear the spirits which they believe control their world are the most prominent and powerful forces in their lives, and the influence of Islam simply brings more fearful uncertainty. My boots plodded through the thick elephant grass in the Imatong Mountains, tracing out a path up a hillside and back in time to an era when missionaries lived and worked here. Their house, like the Bible school they built, lay crumbling and bare, returning to the clay from which its bricks were cast. Sudan's war in the 80s drove the missionaries out and shut down the school. The church scattered, but somehow survived. It even grew. How is that possible? It's been said that the local church is the hope of the world. And in Central Africa, glimpses of that hope still remain, though they might seem like the courageous flickers of a lamp about to go out. I sat and listened to James and John, two young Sudanese pastors aptly named, as they told the story of reclaiming a village for the Lord and how they fought for it, literally on their knees, next to a slab of concrete that was once a whole church. I listened to the sound of drums and the voices of a Zande choir as songs rose above the vaulted roof of a church sanctuary built long ago, rising further still above the canopy of trees in the rainforest of C.A.R. I traveled down the Chari River with Pastor Samuel and ventured onto the waters of Lake Chad. There we prayed, boldly it seemed, for the gospel to one day take root this far inland. I saw the gleaming faces of the graduating class from the Bible Institute in Adi. I saw Pastor Lalima praying over a thousand ravaged and displaced people in Mbukolo. I saw an old man, his life long ago transformed, rebuilding that old Bible school there in the Imatong Mountains. The local church is the hope of the world, and it's the hope for Central Africa. It is God's chosen instrument to transform lives and bring people into His kingdom. It is His instrument to preserve a community, a country, and the world from the debasement and destruction of sin. As Jesus told His disciples, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. What if the salt 
loses its saltiness. One veteran missionary simply looked north to answer this question. North Africa used to have a vibrant church. Today, it's all but gone. He warned that this could happen here too. Are we a generation away? Maybe less? The hard truth is that the church in Central Africa is but a remnant, dealt a double blow from war and syncretism. It's been scattered, persecuted, diluted, and if you ask them, abandoned. I sat in the dark in a semicircle of Congolese pastors at Aru, and they asked us, why haven't the missionaries returned? Because it's hard, we told them. They hear the news of this place and they're afraid. And one of the pastors said something I can't forget. In the past, there were missionaries who loved us, and they accepted to suffer with us. And I wondered if the past was just that, past. The danger now is that the living stones of the body of Christ are looking much like the actual stones of many of the buildings, crumbling, one wall where there should be four, choked and overgrown with weeds. AIM's initial missionary effort in these lands was not perfect, but the foundation laid by those first pioneers somehow endured a 40-year absence. We need to build on that. And church leaders are asking for missionaries, people who love Jesus and are willing to share their lives and talents to perhaps meet a practical need while all along addressing the most important one, transformational discipleship. It's time AIM returned to Central Africa. By day 12 on our 15-day trip, I quit admiring my boots. In fact, I'd grown to resent them. Gore-Tex doesn't really breathe when it's 117 degrees out. My feet were aching and blistered. I remember joking with our pilot something about the feet of those who bring good news, and he chuckled. Don't know why they're called beautiful, he said. The missionaries who have served here have trashed their feet. Only God could call them beautiful. This is a hard place. This is a hard calling. How do you live in a land of persistent instability? How do you minister to the spiritually oppressed and oppressive? How do you learn the language? understand the culture, navigate the government abuse? How do you throw up your hands in frustration and embrace a friend at the same time? What do you do when the next war touches you and it's your turn to flee? What if you lose all your stuff? What if you lose more than just your stuff? What if it's worth it? Can we afford to wait for things to become easy? I don't know what to do with this. God is calling me to something, but is it something this hard? I have these feet and they can go, even if they're not experienced. But the question I'm asking is this, are they willing? Willing to walk some of the earth's most beautiful and devastated lands. Willing to stand side by side with those of my African brothers and sisters. Willing to be trashed in the process and one day be called beautiful. Are my feet willing to move against the fear? don't know what to do with this, but there's one thing I do know. I can no longer just walk away. <laughs>